So welcome to this River Publishers uh, book discussion. I'm Philippa Jeffries, and I have with me Fred Harris, Professor in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department of University of California, San Diego. Uh, before that, he taught electrical and computer engineering at San Diego State University for more than 50 years. He has extensive experience in digital signal processing for communications. And today we're talking about the new edition of his book, Multi-Rate Signal Processing for Communication Systems, that is available now. Uh, Fred, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, um, so to start with, what would you say is the importance of multi-rate signal processing? Uh -huh. Okay, now I could talk for hours on the importance <laughs> of multi-rate signal mm -hmm. processing. The short answer is it will give you the opportunity to solve problems mm -hmm. at reduced cost, higher performance, uh, and a big smile on your face when you're finished because you mm -hmm. had so much fun applying new and clever techniques to solve old problems. Okay. Um, so I would say the main difference between that and kind of standard signal processing is the efficiency. It's, easy. it's efficiency and the a new way of thinking. What, when we learn first linear systems and signal processing, yeah. we emphasize something called linear time invariant filters. Okay. And we have something we avoid in signal processing called aliasing. Mm -hmm. And aliasing means if you don't have a, a sufficiently high sample rate, signals outside of the microzone alias back into the microzone. And okay. aliasing is bad because it covers up the signals of interest. Mm -hmm. The first thing you learn to do in multi-rate signal processing is intentionally alias the data. Okay. And when you intentionally alias the data, you say, wait a second, isn't Nyquist rolling over in his grave? And he could be, for all I know. And I had this wonderful story to tell. Many, many years ago, I designed a, a 65,000 channel channelizer for uh, GTE, a big uh, telephone company in the United States for a government contract. It was a 65,000 channel channelizer for shipboard use. Okay. What I did, I aliased 65,000 channels to baseband and then unalias them as part of the signal processing. That's the magic. You can unalias things if you do it right. Okay. But when we submitted the proposal, the proposal came back a week later and someone wrote in big red letters across the front of the cover, those who don't understand the Nyquist theorem shouldn't be doing signal processing. Yeah. And what I found out, if you're smarter than your reviewer, you're both in trouble. Okay. And subsequently, now everyone understands, it's okay to alias, mm -hmm. providing you have the structure which allows you to undo the alias. Yeah. And because you can do that, the cost goes way, way down because one filter can service multiple channels simultaneously. Okay. And that's, that's part of the magic. Okay, great. And um, your book discusses some of the practical applications of multi-rate systems. Um, I was wondering, could you please talk through a couple of examples of, kind of novel uses for multi-rate signal processing? Okay, well, one of them is you build a channelizer. If I wanted mm -hmm. to build a radio for one channel, I would build an IQ down converter and I'd build a pair of filters, one for in-phase and quadrature. And then I would sample the data and I'd have my... Uh, digital down converted data. If someone said, I need two of these, then you do it again. Yeah. If someone said, I need 10 of these, then you make it 10 times. In a multi-rate filter, you only do it once. You build okay. one filter, and that one filter will service all 10 channels for you. So that one filter has a mm -hmm. much bigger return on investment. Yeah. And the performance you get is comparable to or better than and the cost is orders of magnitude smaller than it would have been. I have an example that uh, you can build a typical filter using ordinary linear time invariant techniques. And the example I use is something called DOCSIS 3.0, which is the uh, OFDM version of cable television okay. in both the States and in Europe. The filter is a 1400 tab filter. It takes two of them, one for I and one for Q, real and imaginary, and it runs at about 300 megahertz. So okay. you're doing 2,800 multiplies 300 million times a second. My friend Chris Dick at Xilinx said, Fred, can you use your multi-rate magic and reduce the workload? 
Yeah. So using the multi-rate techniques, which allow you to downsample and upsample and do things at the low rate because you downsampled it, I built the same filter, which instead of having 2,800 multiplies input mm -hmm. per hour, only had 100 multiplies input wow. per hour. So that's more than an order of magnitude. Yeah, yeah. It used to be you could heat your cup of tea on the chip that was doing the work. Now you can't do that anymore. It's not hot enough. <laughs> okay. Um, and Kirk, moving on from that, so this is the second edition, actually, of the book. How have right. things in this area developed, do you think, since the previous edition? Are there any kind of new concepts included? There's a whole bunch of new concepts. One of the things I learned along the way mm -hmm. as we were developing products for uh, other customers and yeah. about academia is that we have two kinds of filters, one which does analysis and one that does synthesis. What you can do is put the two together as a single package and do magic with it. And one of the magics you can do is you can synthesize other filters by using an analyzer to make a whole bunch of little narrow channels. And then okay. the synthesizer to take the narrow channels and synthesize what I call a super channel. And the super channel can be any multiple of the number of skinny little channels glued together. I describe it as building a wall with bricks. Yeah. You put all the bricks together, you can build any wall you want. Well, here you do the same thing. You have a brick for one channel, mm. put two bricks together, you get two channels building a super channel twice as wide. If you put 20 of these guys together, you can get 20 channels. And the cost of doing it in this very clever trick is more than an order of magnitude reduced relative to the cost of solving the problem mm -hmm. directly. Now, along the same lines, when we were building these ch multiple channelizers, DC is a funny thing to use in a spectrum analyzer and a channelizer because DC looks like interference in many systems. Okay. And, and if you use a straight Fourier transform to do the alias unwrapping, DC is in the middle of channel number zero. And a lot of people don't like that, so they try to shift the spectrum so DC is at the boundary between two adjacent channels. Well, it used to be a very expensive thing to do, <laughs> to shift the spectrum because the shifting occurs at a very high input sample rate if you're okay. building a receiver channel. Yeah. I invented a couple of techniques which allow you to have DC in the center of the band or at the boundary between the bands with no additional cost. So that's a little part of it we've added recently. It's called even index and odd index channel centers. Wonderful. We use that in a particular satellite that a company here in the States is building. Oh, really? We're going to launch 4,000 of these things. And one of the things I was asked to do is reduce the cost of the signal processing. Yeah. To reduce the heat generated aboard the satellite, because it's hard to dissipate the heat if you're in outer space. So one of the things I did, I got rid of their IQ offset by shifting the spectrum as part of the signal processing and modified the channelizer so I could have DC in the center of a bin or at the edge of a bin. And then I used my other techniques to reduce the cost of all the other signal processing going on in the bird so that the total cost is only about 10% of the original cost. Oh, wow. I, I earned my keep showing you how to use multi-rate <laughs> yeah, to make the less expensive and more desirable. Yeah, it definitely shows it's worth looking at the way it you're doing your is. signal processing. The, the newest one I'm doing recently is we have some faculty who are building <laughs> hearing aids. And hearing okay. aids have channelizers in them. You take the input signal, break them up into narrow band channels, and then you change the gain of each channel or you modify each channel to match the person's yeah. hearing loss. And then you have to reassemble the signal to only have one earphone to play in each ear. So these are called perfect reconstruction filter banks. And in the past, people didn't do it right because people who did it were acousticians, not signal processors. Yeah. So I brought in the multi-ray techniques and we're now designing a whole new way of building filter banks for hearing aids. People will start enjoying that soon as soon as we start building products. After them. We also use these hearing aid filter banks 
for doing the hearing aid testing. How do you test the patient to find out where their hearing loss resides? And how do you fix it to maximize their comfort level and reduce the cost of building the machine? Because you have little bitty batteries in hearing mm. aids. And again, the multi-rate does all of that for you. Builds better filters, lower cost, longer battery life. And when we start building them and actually testing them, we'll demonstrate the consumer will be pleased with mm. the improvement in their performance. So that's a fun one to do. Yeah. I used to do things with gigahertz kinds of bandwidth. Yeah. And learn the sampler rate so you could build them less expensively. Now what we're doing is we're building very low energy, uh, low cost, small filters that go into hearing aids where the most important parameter is how long the battery is going to last. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, and I've got a wonderful PhD student finishing her PhD on the new class of filters that go into hearing aids. Oh, fantastic. Um, great. I'm afraid I'm kind of coming to an end now, but uh, do you have any final thoughts on what the readers might be able to take away from your book? Oh, yeah. The, the, the thing you take away from mm -hmm. my philosophy is you can always reduce the cost of solving the problem if you can lower the sampler rate as part of solving the problem. Yeah. Typically what we do, we do the signal processing, reduce the bandwidth, and then lower the sample rate at the end when all the work is done. Yeah. What we do is we turn the tables, turn it the other way. First lower the sample rate. That causes the aliasing. Then all the workload occurs at very, very low data rate with show mm. filters. And then you undo the aliasing to put yeah. the data back the way you want it. That saving is always an order of magnitude. And anytime I do a design, I think, is there a better way to do this? And I try some other ways. And I think the answer in general is no. And that comes from a biased observer, of course. Of course. But I'm an informed biased observer, so that might have value. Exactly. Um, well, I'm sorry I have to end it there, but thank you very much Fred, for joining me today to talk about your book. It's been really interesting. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to have a chance to talk to you.